Thank you, Laskin Corla, and thank you, Minister, for the opportunity to speak on this bill, which I welcome, and I agree with Deputy, Deputy Callaghan that it is actually the, the best of the different iterations that have come out over the last number of years. And thank you for um, the response to the Justice Committee recommendations and the, and the work on the bill. There are a couple of things, um, just in response to Deputy Gould, the Irish judiciary has one of the, the strongest support from the Irish people in terms of institutional independence, and it's internationally recognised as in the, uh, in the top five and indeed the top ten. Ten, um, along with other countries like Norway, Finland, uh, New Zealand, Australia. But New Zealand in particular actually is interesting because it's, the only co it's a country that appoints all its judges entirely by political means, with no external reference. And it, and it actually is the Attorney General who leads on that point. So the things are not necessarily connected, that political appointments therefore mean a judiciary that isn't respected or independent. It's, it's much, much more complex than that. So I just want to, to make that similarly, Deputy Catherine Murphy said, you know, that the reform of the judicial appointment system you know, in 1996, fell, you know, wasn't a real reform, fell short of real reform. But it was a real reform, because before then, you could, the government could appoint absolutely anybody they wanted, so long as they were 10 or 12 years qualified. And it made a huge reduction on political discretion for the government, where that, instead of the universe being everybody who was qualified, the universe of people were now the seven names that were being recommended by the Judicial Appointments Advisory Board. And what happened was actually, not the legislation um, or the application of the legislation by the government, but most bizarrely by the Judicial Appointments Advisory Board itself. It was set up and given extraordinary powers to reduce the universe of government discretion from everyone who is qualified to the people who applied and the seven names whom they recommended having assessed them. And from about 1995 to 2002, they did recommend about seven names, maybe six, maybe, you know, about seven names as the legislation described. And indeed, they had power to recommend fewer than that if that's what they wanted to do. And that's what happened until about 2002, 2003. And at that time, the membership of the board decided to take a different approach, which was to recommend all of those people who were not unsuitable. And they got legal senior counsel advice at the time to say, well, was the board acting constitutionally or not? Now, I do not know why they needed senior counsel advice when you look at the composition of the board, which included the Attorney General, the Chief Justice, the President of the High Court, and so on and so on and so on. But that they reinterpreted their own function. They reinterpreted the function of the institution under the legislation. And I genuinely don't know why. I have never managed to figure out why they did it. But the effect of what they did, and this was not at the request of government, not at the request of the Oireachtas Justice Committee, and was never reviewed uh, in any meaningful way, the effect was now to recommend all of those people who were not unsuitable. So if you had, for example, 150 applications for a district court position, about 100 of those would be deemed suitable under the Act. And instead of recommending seven out of the 100 suitable, they recommended all 100, which gave all of the political discretion back to the government, but not at the government's request or behest, but entirely because of the decision-making of the Judicial Appointments Advisory Board. It is genuinely inexplicable. And that continued then until 2014 or so, when it was described in, in, publicly, and then they brought their practice back to in and around seven. So the question of political discretion is bandied about as though the government wants it all the time, is trying to acquire as much as possible. But actually the government restricted its own discretion in 1995-96, got it all back from the Judicial Appointments Advisory Board, pointed out the problem, and the discretion, discretion was reduced again. So it's just, it's just not true to say that it's some kind of cosy cartel of the government trying to grab all this discretion for itself at all times. It's just not the way it worked. It was the procedures of the Judicial Appointments Advisory Board. The other things that they didn't do well, unfortunately, was they never interviewed, despite having the statutory power, they never interviewed anybody. They could have, um, but they didn't uh, for, what, for, for, for various different reasons, uh, but mostly because they didn't they had the expertise or the capacity to do it. But what that meant was the government had no real detail about who was being recommended to them or why they were being recommended. So again, we talk here about ranking and should it be ranked or should it not be ranked, and the political discretion point that I'm making is important because it's an important constitutional point. But it doesn't really matter if the, if the Judicial Appointments Commission or the Judicial Appointments Advisory Board isn't going to engage in really serious analysis of the candidates in a professional way, in the way that the public appointment system does, in the way that T TLAC does, and give really quality information to government about why they've picked this person, their relative merits, their relative strengths, and so on and so on, and to be able to make an analysis. And it's perfectly possible that you can have candidates of, of equal merit, but who are candidates for very different reasons. A very good commercial lawyer, a very good criminal lawyer, there are lots of different types of candidates and it is important for the government to be able to make political choices between those people but they're not political with with capital P choices they're not party political choices but subtler political choices like the choice that was made by 
the government in 2011 to remedy the gender deficit on the courts. That was a political choice uh, to appoint essentially two out of every three appointments being female. Um, so those are the sorts of broad political choices uh, that are needed. And indeed, I discussed this, I remember, with Deputy McLaughlin, um, as, he then, uh, as, as, as he was then in 2014 or 15 or so in the Iraq This Justice Committee, pointing out that, you know, he, you know if, if he were Minister for Justice, for example, if Martin, Mr. Deputy Kenny were Minister for Justice, there might be broader political choices that you might wish to make between three competent, qualified people who have been assessed under a statutory process and where there's quality information going. So it's not as, it's, it's, it's a sort of a simple political charge, oh, well, ranking, you know, you're not ranking it, therefore, the Attorney General is involved, therefore. It's, 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 it, I just think it's a, bit more, it's a bit more complex than that. I think this bill is, a, is the best iteration, as Deputy O'Callaghan has said. I think it's important that all appointments go through it. I think it's important that the Minister be aware of all of the people who have applied, because at least then that way it gives the Minister a safeguard to be able to assess whether or not diversity really is coming through the Judicial Appointments Advisory Board. They publish their annual reports every year and they give a breakdown of who was appointed, the gender breakdown, the, you know, the, the professional breakdown and so on. Or oh, sorry, of who, who applied, excuse me, um, I'm mistaken, of who applied, but never of who came out the other side. Now, um, uh, which, 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 is, which is a barrier to being able to assess whether or not real diversity is coming through the JAB in itself, because it was impossible for the government really, although they had the statutory power to appoint somebody other than a person who was recommended by the Judicial Appointments Advisory Board, they only ever did it once in the case of a person who subsequently became Chief Justice. So the fact that they had the discretion to do it was irrelevant, was, statutorily irrelevant, because, was statutorily relevant, but in practice irrelevant because they never ever did it. So again, you have this sort of bandying, bandying about of political this, political that, but if you look at the vast majority of the, the, the application um, by the government of the Act, they, they never used the scale of political discretion that they had that was available to them all, all the way through. Um, and in fact, the real difficulty, which, I, which, which I'm sure will be remedied in the case of the new Judicial Appointments Commission, was the institutional drift that, that the body went through itself. So I, um, the, uh, I, I think the bill is, is, is very welcome. I enjoy, enjoyed taking it through committee stages um, and to continue the debate about the role of the Attorney General and rankings and so on. But really what you have is a very strongly independent judiciary in Ireland, a, a very good system that's comparatively benched, and this is an important institutional reform and improvement, but that's all it is.